Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. In this unit, we're going to talk about the implementation we're going to use that uses thematic relations to capture the notions of subcategories and selectional restrictions in order to limit the uh, impact that the generality of X-bar theory has. X-bar theory, you will recall, overgenerates. So using thematic relations and a couple of other tools, we are going to try and limit how it overgenerates. First of all, let's talk about theta roles. You'll often hear the term theta role used interchangeably with the notion of thematic relation, but in fact they're different things. Thematic relations are purely semantic relations. Theta roles, by contrast, are a bundle of thematic relations, and it's associated with a particular syntactic position. So theta roles are about syntactic positions. Thematic relations are about the semantic relationships between words. Thematic relations and theta roles are not the same thing. One of the important ways they differ is that a particular argument can have multiple thematic relations but it only ever has one theta role. Um, we can take this, and let's look at an example here. We have the sentence, Brian gave the doorknob to Mary. Now, here are the thematic relationships associated with each of these arguments. Brian is the subject, and it's associated with two thematic relations, agent and source. The doorknob is the theme, and it is associated with one thematic relationship, the theme. And Mary is both a recipient and a goal. These are the thematic relations. Now we contrast this to the boxes around these thematic relations. The boxes represent the theta roles. So they're effectively bundles of thematic relations that are associated one-to-one -one with arguments. So there's one theta role for Brian, that's that first box. There's a second theta role for doorknob, that's the second box. And there's a third theta role for Mary. So theta roles line up with argument positions. One thing we need to note is that there is a common uh, way of abbreviating the notion of theta role. So you'll hear uh, people talk about the agent theta role. Technically, this is incorrect. Agent refers to the thematic relation. But it's easiest to talk about, uh, about theta roles by referring to the most prominent uh, thematic relationship within that theta role. So if we have a theta role that has an agent and a source thematic relation in it, we would call that theta role the agent theta role. Theta roles are syntactic positions Terms like agent refer to thematic relations, but we put them together and um, we, can, we can refer to the arguments in that way. Now, there's a critical one-to-one -one matching of theta roles and arguments. In other words, the number of theta roles and the number of arguments you have. So, take, for example, the verb place. Place requires three arguments. It requires an agent, a theme, and a goal. So you have the sentence, John placed the flute on the table, John is the agent, the flute is a theme, and on the table is the goal. If you should leave any of these off, what you get is an ungrammatical sentence. So place the flute on the table is not good because we've left off the agent. John placed the flute, we've left off the goal. John placed on the table, we've left off the theme. It's also the case that if we have too many arguments, then the sentence is going to be ungrammatical. So John placed the flute, the violin on the table. There we appear to have two themes. That's unacceptable. Um, also, if you have the wrong category of items, so John placed the flute, the table, the goal has to be expressed in a prepositional phrase. 
with this particular verb. And finally, the rock placed the sky with the fork. These are the wrong types of arguments. So rocks can't, aren't good agents. Normally you can't place the sky with the fork. It's probably an instrument rather than a goal. So here we have a case where we have the wrong types of elements and that results in ungrammaticality. So what we need is a one-to-one -one match of theta rules and arguments. I do want to say one thing about John placed the flute, the violin on the table. Many of you will say, but what about you can say John placed the flute and the violin on the table. This is not a counter argument because when you can join two things together, they become a single item. So John placed the flute and the violin. What you've done is you've created a complex noun phrase, the flute and the violin, which serves as the theme. So that's not a counterexample to this one-to-one -one matching of theta rules and arguments. So too many, too few, or the wrong kinds of arguments are going to result in ungrammaticality. How do we code this? We're going to code this in a, uh, a piece of information that we're going to store in the lexical entries of particular verbs. So this would be part of the lexical entry for the verb place. It has the following bits. We have the name of the predicate. We have a series of boxes, and each column here, each box column, represents a theta roll. So we have the agent theta roll is the leftmost box, then we have the theme theta roll, and then we have the goal theta roll. And those are those three columns. The indices here, are not the same as the indices used in binding theory. These are indices to indicate which theta roll is assigned to which noun phrase in a sentence. So we have, um, in our sentence, you'll see that the index i is associated with the agent, and that uh, i is also on John. The theme is, in, is indicated by the index j, which goes on the flute, and the K is associated with the goal prepositional phrase, and it's got, uh, it's, that's on, on the table. Now, there are a couple of other things to notice about this. You'll notice that uh, there is categories mentioned in these theta grids. So this is important because it's going to give us the subcategorizational information. So it's going to ensure that John is a DP or a noun phrase, uh, the flute is a DP, and the goal is expressed in a prepositional phrase. Because we know individual verbs also put those categorial restrictions on the arguments they appear with. Uh, another thing you'll notice is that one of these uh, theta roles is not the same as the other, in that it's indicated with an underline. We call this special theta role the, the, the external role. And this is the theta role that is always mapped to the subject position in the sentence. So we can mark in theta grids that one argument goes in the subject position. All the other theta roles are called internal theta roles. Um, those internal theta roles typically are complements to uh, the verb. Now, um, you'll notice I said complements, and you're only allowed one complement. We will come back to this problem with ditransitives later in Unit 14. For the moment, you can't have two complements uh, in the X-bar theory we've proposed, but this theta grid would imply that you need two complements. We'll come back to that. Okay, an important thing is that adjuncts are not included in your theta grids. You never include uh, anything that's an adjunct into your theta grid. So remember, um, uh, one thing about adjuncts is that with verbs, adjuncts are optional, whereas complements and subjects are typically obligatory. Um, and we can see this with the adjunct on Friday. On Friday um, uh, is optional. It can either be there or not. We would never actually include um, a time like this or any other kind of adjunct into our um, theta grids. As I mentioned, ditransitives are tricky. Okay, so we now have theta roles and we have theta grids. Theta roles are the boxes. 
grids are the requirements that, that a verb or, or another kind of predicate places on the structure. It lists all the required arguments and their thematic relations and their categories. And then the last thing we have is what's called a constraint. And this particular constraint is called the theta criterion. The theta criterion is like a kind of filter. It acts to throw out sentences that are bad. And it throws out sentences that are bad if it doesn't meet the conditions it states. So the conditions the theta criterion uh, puts on sentences is that they meet the theta criterion if and only if, that's what IFF means, it's if and only if, every argument must have one and only one theta role and every theta role is assigned. This is a fancy way of expressing that one-to-one -one correspondence I already mentioned. But it has two parts. It makes sure that every argument has a theta role, and it makes sure that every theta role is assigned. That gives us the one-to-one -one relationship. Let's look at an example. So we're going to take the verb love. Love requires two theta roles. It requires an experiencer, and it requires a theme. The experiencer is mapped into the subject position, so it is underlined. The theme is mapped into the object position, so it's not. The experiencer and the theme must both be DPs. So an example of a grammatical sentence like this would be something like, um, Megan loves Kevin. Now, once we put in the indexes, that link the arguments in the sentence to the theta grid. We see that Megan has an I, which is assigned to the experiencer role, and Kevin has a J, which is assigned to the, the theme role. This sentence meets the theta criterion because every argument has a theta role. Megan has the experiencer, Kevin has the theme, and every theta role is assigned to an argument. So the experiencer is assigned to Megan, and the theme is assigned to Kevin. Now let's look at what happens if things go askew, and we don't have the right number of arguments, or the right type of arguments. So let's say we leave off Kevin. We've got Megan loves, and again, this is the use of the verb love. Um, I don't mean she has a loving capacity. I'm talking about uh, the particular usage of the love which is a, a transitive verb love, where there's an object of her affection, not just a general um, ability to love everyone. Th that, that particular meaning is not the one I intend here. So Megan loves without Kevin is ungrammatical. Why is this the case? Well, Megan gets a theta role. So uh, it gets the external DP experiencer role which is marked with the index I. But what you'll notice is that that theme argument is not assigned. So this violates the second uh, part of the definition of the theta criterion. There is a theta role that is not associated with an argument. So this sentence is ungrammatical because of that empty box. We can flip this around and do the same kind of thing if we add an extra argument, which is also ungrammatical. Megan loves Kevin Jason. That's ungrammatical because there's an, a, a DP here that doesn't have a theta, uh, theta role. The, Megan has a theta role. It's assigned the index I, or it, which is the experiencer. Kevin has a theta role. It's the theme with the J. But Jason, which has the index K, has no theta role associated with it. So that's what makes this sentence ungrammatical. That's the first part of the definition of the theta criterion, which says every DP must have a theta role. Again, this sentence is ameliorated by putting an and between Kevin and Jason, but that in that situation, Kevin and Jason, Kevin and Jason as a unit, get the theme theta role, get the index I, because you've used the conjunction. Okay, now let's, we, we haven't yet talked about how our model all fits together. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about how the theta criterion and theta grids and 
uh, X bar rules all work together to get us the judgments we have about our sentences. Because remember, we're trying to model competence, which is your knowledge, and you get at that knowledge by doing judgments. So let's think about the bits we have. Um, we have X bar rules. The X bar rules are the things that generate trees. So you want to think of um, X bar rules sort of taking words and assembling them together into a tree. Then what you do is you check that tree against various kinds of constraints. We've already talked about uh, a number of constraints. I just haven't brought it all together for you. For, so, for example, the binding conditions are in fact constraints on trees. Principle A says um, anaphores must find an antecedent within their binding uh, domain. That means look at the tree and make sure those conditions on anaphores hold. Condition B about pronouns. The, the pronoun cannot find an antecedent within its binding domain. And our expressions can't ever find an antecedent. The same thing holds true for the theta criterion. The theta criterion says, oh, let's look at this verb's theta grid and make sure all the theta roles are assigned. And secondly, make sure that all the DPs in the tree get theta roles. So if those constraints don't, aren't met by the tree, then the constraints effectively filter out the badly constructed trees. So you might be able to construct a tree with X-bar theory, but it might get thrown out by one of these constraints. Let's look at a model of how that would work. You have to imagine that this is a, this is a model of what might be going on in your mind. Be very careful, this is just a model. There's no uh, claim that there's actually neurons that are doing this. This is just our attempt to explain what may be happening in your mind. This is also just a first try. We're gonna have to revise this and, and, and build on it. So here's the basic idea. You have a lexicon of words. Your lexicon consists of all of that unpredictable information that we talked about uh, before. It, it, talks of, it, it includes the meaning of the words, it includes the, um, the sounds of the words, it includes any morphological irregularities. And critically, it contains information about the argument structure associated with a particular word. And we code those argument structure constraints in terms of theta roles. So we might have the verb love requires an experiencer and a theme. And that is part of the lexical entry for the verb love. Then we take the words that are in our lexicon and we feed them into what's called the computational component. This, the computational component means the part of your brain that does work and builds sentences together. And the computational component at, on this first pass has two parts. It has the X bar rules, which build up those trees puts things in complement positions, puts things in specifier positions, projects up all those bar levels, and builds out as many trees as it likes, and then you feed those trees to your constraints. And right now we have, um, we have four constraints, the theta criterion and the three binding conditions, and you effectively check those X bar trees against those um, constraints. Um, what results out of that are your judgments, your ability to tell whether a sentence is acceptable or not, relies upon your use of your lexical knowledge and your computational knowledge. And your computational knowledge has two bits, the thing that builds trees and the thing that checks trees. Next, we are gonna talk about some problematic cases where the theta criterion uh, doesn't hold at first pass, but once we sort of examine it a little better, we'll see that, um, that the theta criterion does the work we need it to do.